Good morning, everybody. Thanks, David. So good to see y'all this morning. Uh, this is the day the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Let's stand up and get started with a psalm or two. There is an endless song echoes in my soul. I hear the music ring. And though the storms may come, I am holding on. And to the rock I cling. How can I keep from singing? Your praise, how can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. I will lift my eyes in the dark. from singing your praise how can i ever say enough how amazing is your love how can i keep from shouting your name i know i am loved by the king and it makes my heart how can i keep from singing your can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart. I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to see. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, let the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. From the ends of the earth. Depths of the sea, let all creation praise his name from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, let all creation praise his name. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. From the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, let all creation praise His name. From the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, let all creation praise His name. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, 
shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Amen. Great start to the morning. Have a seat for just a minute. Ty says, how are you going to follow that? I'm not. Um, yeah, great start. Thank you so much for being here today. We're so excited that you are. If this is your first time here or maybe your second or third time here and you've been just kind of coming in and out and really haven't met a whole lot of people, which I hope is not the case, we'd love to get some more information on you just so we can reach out and say, hey, see if there's any needs that we can meet. Um, we would love to get better connected with you. I see some faces that I have not seen before, so I'm talking to you. Um, so just a couple of quick announcements. Um, we don't start every Sunday at 1030. Um, you have to get here a whole hour earlier uh, to really get in on everything that's happening on Sunday. We've got what we call learning communities, Sunday school, whatever name you want to put to it. We've got several classes that are meeting. They're over in this wing of the church. Some really great things happening. Um, some really good discussions, some really good um, you know, community sharing happening. So come and check one out if you haven't already. Um, we've been saying for weeks now, we're going to continue saying it. We got VBS that's come back this year. It's going to be June 13th through the 17th. There's a sign up booth that's out in the lobby. Um, that's probably going to be manned again after church, I would assume. I know it is prior to church, but if you haven't stopped by, see if there's a way you can volunteer. If you've got kids who are VBS age, which I honestly do not know the ages, I'm not going to say it. Somebody wants to call it out. K through five. K through five, she says. K through 12, everybody's welcome. Everybody's coming. Um, but volunteer, if you can't volunteer, I'm sure they would take donations um, to, to assist with the things that need to be bought there. But we're excited about that coming back. It's been a long time since we've had VBS. Wednesday night classes, um, we're continuing through our study um, of the Bible Project series. Um, the elders have been facilitating that. Again, some really good discussion, some good time to share together. Um, this coming Sunday, May 22nd, we're going to have Senior Recognition Day. It's going to kind of be a full day. We're going to start with breakfast. Anybody who likes to eat breakfast like me, I'll show up for that. Um, then in here, we're going to have tables that are set up. You know how we normally do with each senior having a table. I think Stephen tells me we've got six this year. But if you want to stop by and um, you know drop a note for the seniors, maybe a note of encouragement, um, it's always interesting to see those. This year we also have a senior, so if you see some, if, if it appears I've got allergies that day, my eyes are watering, don't, don't be alarmed. Um, but that should be a great day. Stephen's going to be preaching that day. And I thought it's interesting too, so Stephen preached last week. We've got Paul preaching this week, Stephen next week. It seems like we've got the Evans takeover. Um, I see what you're doing there. <laughs> Let's see. Um, I think the two more things. So, you know, leading our communion experience every week is a really um, important part of what we do. And some would say, and I might agree, it's, it's the most important thing that we do. Um, and we're, we're trying to get a, a pool of, of people that are interested in doing that to sign up for that. And I believe there's, a, there's an email that's gone out. It probably will go out again this week. Um, so if you're interested in that, please sign up. And, and kind of raise your hand and let us know that you would be interested in, you know, participating in that. We just really want to put some intentional um, thought to that. So please sign up if you're interested. One other thing I wanted to mention, just some people you can be praying for this week. I know we've seen some emails go, go out, but um, Jean Kane, she's, um, you know, she's having a hard time. She's, she's doing some better now, but not out of the woods yet. I know um, Keith mentioned this morning that um, Jeannie Hogan, um, you know, not looking particularly good there. Um, just keep that family in your prayers. Um, you know, Lois Meyer still recovering, um, you know, and, and there are more. But let's just let's keep, continually keep um, these members that we may don't, you know, see every Sunday. Um, just keep them in our prayers throughout the week. So let's pray and then we'll, we'll get back to, to praise. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this morning, for um, the love that, that we have for each other, Father, for the love that you have for us. 
Father, we thank you so much for, for that. It's such a blessing. We thank you most of all for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I will worship, I will worship with all of my heart. With all of my
exalts you on high forever, King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. We will have no other gods before you. We will have no other gods before you. Nothing on earth will compete for your throne. You are the sovereign I am and you'll reign in our hearts alone. Exalt you on high forever, King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. We will have no other gods before you. Okay, uh, we're going to have a little congregational involvement this morning before we uh, have communion, and I promise you there'll be a tie-in to it. What I'd like you to do is to, if, if, uh, if you consider yourself to be a truly grateful person, raise your hand. Okay. I didn't see any hands down. You don't want your neighbor to look at you and say, you're not grateful, you know. So, let me go to one of my church daughters here, Brandy. What are you grateful, grateful for, man? My family. Your family. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the first thought that we would all have, right, to be grateful for our families. Bo, what are you grateful for this morning? I'm grateful for the soul of serving salvation. For salvation. Yeah. That's wonderful. Who else can I pick on? One more. Ginger, what are you thankful for this morning? Thankful for this wonderful church family that supports me in every way. Marvelous. And particularly you're thankful for a bunch of old folks that you can kind of steer around into having dinners and luncheons and take on trips with you, right? Gratitude is the, uh, the topic that I, I kind of want to talk about today, and uh, most of you are familiar with John Mark Hicks. He's preached here before. He's the friends of, of many of us here, and John Mark has a, uh, he's got a blog, but he also on, on, on uh, Facebook and I think Instagram posts readings and, and certain, you know, little, little things every day. And a lot of his readings are from church fathers who lived like 1,500 years ago. And uh, I like to read them because, you know, they always uh, uh, sort of reach me inside and, and, and uh, do something to me to help, help me spiritually, you know, through the day. And one of them recently that, that I read uh, that has to do with gratitude, I'd like to share it with you. And it was written by Basil, who was the bishop of Caesarea uh, Mazaka in Cappadocia, Asia Minor. Everybody knows where that is, right? That's, that's uh, modern-day Turkey. And I'll read this to you. When you sit down to eat, pray. When you eat bread, do so thanking God for being so generous to you. If you drink wine, be mindful of God, who has given it to you for your pleasure or as a relief in sickness. When you dress, thank God for kindness in providing you with clothes. When you look at the sky and the beauty of the stars, throw yourself at God's feet and adore the one who in wisdom has arranged th all things in this way. Similarly, when the sun goes down and when it rises, when you are asleep or when you're awake, give thanks to God who arranged all things for your benefit to have you know, love, and praise their creator. I really thought that was profound and it had uh, an impact on me in the, in the way that I did a self-examination, self-analysis. Am, am I truly a grateful person? And uh, it, it's like all of you who raised your hand, you know, generally when you're asked that, you think, uh, yeah, I am a grateful person. 
When you go deep inside, you have to, you have to ask yourself, what am I grateful for? The simple things, the important things. And so it, it made me um, examine myself, and I think that's really good. And I think, you know, part of what we do in communion is to, is to examine ourselves. So I kind of looked back you know, in the past at what my history of gratitude has been and my observation of others. And one little uh, vignette that uh, I remembered, and, and I, I think about it a lot, is uh, when our kids were growing up and we would have, have lunch or dinner at the table, you know, our three boys would uh, take turns uh, praying. And Chad, our middle son, had a, a part of his prayer every single time was that he would say, thank you, God, for mom cooking this dinner. And thank you, dad, for making the money to buy it. And every single time he would pray up until when he was a teenager, that he would use those words. And, you know, we thought they were humorous. They were funny at the time. But, you know, he, that was heartfelt on his part. And uh, had a... Uh, had a huge impact on me in terms of what his, in his mind, what he was grateful for and maybe and taught me a lesson. So this morning, when I asked you the question, I'm sure through your mind you were thinking about different things you were thankful for. So what am I grateful for this morning? And there's several things that I'd like to share. I'm thankful for God that wants me to live with him one day so bad he gives me a way to do that. I'm grateful to my God and his son, without whom I have nothing. I'm grateful for God's mercy, for his grace, which I don't really deserve. And this morning, in particular, I'm grateful for all of you who have uh, come this morning to encourage me, to be encouraged, and to glorify God by celebrating the resurrection of his son who died on the cross. And that one fact, that one event, there's nothing else in our lives that is more important uh, for us to be grateful for than that. And that's why we're here today, is to celebrate Christ's resurrection. So after I pray and uh, during, during our communion this morning, think about the things in your life that you're grateful for, large or small, the people in your life who have blessed your life, family members or non-family members. But most of all, that while you're, while you're uh, meditating and while you're thinking, just be thankful for a, a father who has given us everything and keeps on giving. So let's pray. God, we're so thankful for uh, this day, Father. We're thankful for the fact that you created all of us in your image. Uh, you gave us life. You gave us spirits, Father. We're thankful for uh, the lives that we live, for the, the small things and the large things, for everything that you give us, Father. Everything that we have and are is because of you. This morning, Father, as we are about to commune with each other, with Christ and with all uh, the saved around the world as we, as we do this, Father, we're so thankful for him. We're thankful for the short life that he lived, for the teachings that he taught, taught us how to live and how to be and how to interact with each other. And Father, while we uh, are uh, really mortified by his death, his cruel death, Father, we're, it's more than made up, Father, with our amazement at his resurrection. And we know one day that you're going to raise us up to, to live with you and with him. And we're so thankful for that, Father. And we, uh, we, as, we as we commune together, and, uh, and take of the, of, the, of the bread and of the, uh, the juice that, that symbolizes his body and his blood, Father. And when the blood that washed our sons away, Father, we're so thankful, so grateful, Father. And so we offer this, uh, this prayer in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Oh, Lord, you search me. You know my way.
dismiss our little ones that would be our kids ages three up through kindergarten to a very special time of worship for them uh, if you don't know where that is your child's maybe a little intrigued you're going to head out these doors to the right someone will be there to greet them paul leave me on for just a second as you're coming up you you're a sports fan right S semi i mean you can tell i'm an athlete yeah you you remember back in the day when uh, uh when Sports Center had those commercials about the perfect show. I'm not that much Ken, of an athlete. I've missed Ken, that. I missed Ken, that. Kenny, Kenny Mayne and, uh, and, and uh, Scott uh, Van Pelt would, would have these commercials, and, and it was like they would mess up just one word or whatever, and they just fell short of the perfect Sports Center, sort of like throwing a perfect game in baseball. Yeah, anytime the words mess up like that, that's what I think of is, uh, yeah, well, it was oh, man. almost the perfect service. It was, it was still incredible. I, I, led worship. I led worship for about 15 years. I don't know a single lyric. And anybody that was in the booth knew it. And, and if the lyrics weren't up, I just stopped. And I just waited. I didn't usually make a comment. One time we were singing one of, it, it was something like um, I'll Fly Away. Super easy song. Most of us grew up singing that. And for somehow they found a verse that I'd never seen in my life. And it came up on the screen and I just stopped and said, mystery lyrics, let's go to the next verse. And that's what we had to do. Nobody ever even cared, so it was fantastic. In fact, um, I probably should have brought something up to wipe my head. It worship was so good, I was already sweating by the time we got up here. It was awesome. So much positive energy. I love you guys any time that I get to come up. I uh, also love that Stephen is up here. Uh, I don't know how many times today somebody asked me if I'd heard Stephen's lesson from last week. 
on women's role or something like that. I don't have any controversy today, but I tell you what I'm doing. I'm going home and listening to it and sending them some notes of correction. I'm just kidding. We're super proud. Marla and I are super proud of, of Stephen, and we love you guys and, and love that he's able to have ministry up here. You know, most of us, when it comes to uh, living the Christian life, we've got some favorite verses. We've got things that we've memorized, which is awesome because you've got something like Psalm 119.11 that says, Your word I've hid in my heart that I will not sin against you. It's great to have that content. Some of us, our favorite verse is like Jeremiah 29.11 that says something along the lines of, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans not to harm you, but to prosper you and to give you hope and a future. Most of us grew up memorizing John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Some, one says, verse, those of us who are older, his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. A lot of us love Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And one of my favorite verses we're going to look at this morning is John 10, 10. And it simply says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. And some versions say more abundantly. So we've got these verses that we have memorized. The only challenge is sometimes we know the content, but we don't actually know the context. I always get tickled when our favorite verses like Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you. This came right before they went into captivity for 70 years, you know? So there was something pretty challenging on the back of that. So when we look at a passage like John 10, 10, that says, I want you to have this full life, we've got to ask, what caused him to make this statement? Why did he need to give us this assurance? What's the story behind this? And the story's not simply the preceding verses in chapter 10. We've got to go back to chapter 9 to understand the scenario of what took place and how he got to this position. And I think it's a lot of encouragement for us today, and I also believe it's a lot of what we face in our world today. So if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 9. It's going to be text heavy this morning. Where's the clock? Oh, there it is. Good. Fantastic. I'm trying to keep my eye on that because I don't have this timed out because there is a lot of verses. So starting the beginning of chapter 9, it says, As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Very common belief back then. Somebody has got some sort of physical ailment, somebody sinned. Now, they were just saying it was him or his parents. However, a lot of people believe that you could have done something in a previous life, and when you were reincarnated, that trouble came along with you. Others believe that it was a sin in the future that now you receive the curse in the present. But Jesus says, no, it wasn't him or his parents that sinned. This happened so that God may be displayed and glorified in his life. As long as it is today, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when, um, when, you can, when no man can work. And when I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And having said that, he spit on the ground, and he made some mud, and with his saliva, he put it on the man's eyes, and he said, go to him, wash in the pool of Siloam, and the word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. And so Jesus performs this miracle, and he's basically showing the disciples. The disciples say, who sinned? He could have just passed him by, but as a rabbi, he realizes this is a moment of great teaching, and this man is not simply blind, he's in darkness, and he's been in darkness his entire life. And Jesus says, there's a time coming, darkness is coming where nobody can work. But guess what? While I'm here, I am the light of the world. And to prove that I'm the light, I'm going to bring light into this man's life. I'm going to bring life. I'm going to bring fullness. I'm going to bring abundance. So John 10.10 10 is actually happening right out of the gate in John 9. So you think that once this miracle takes place, everybody's pumped up, they're excited, they're just cheering them on, here's the blind man. But as you know, when good things happen in your life, when you feel like I'm kind of on a roll here, I feel like I'm being blessed, it seems like at that moment, for some reason, things start going sideways. Now, this guy's not going to get too discouraged. I love that about him. Most of us would get fairly discouraged. It says that his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed he was. Others said, no, it only looks like him. 
But he insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open? They demanded. The man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes, and he told me to go to the pool of Siloam and wash. I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know. I don't know. You see, when I was there with him, I'd never seen a thing in my life. I was blind. I don't know. I'd never seen the man. By the time I went and washed, I don't know where he is. But they're not simply saying, hey, let's praise God for this miracle. They're starting to investigate. And this is part of the confusion and the challenge that often happens, the conflict that happens when life through the full shows up in our life. And the confusion and conflict right here that begins is they're confused if this is even the guy. Well, he, he looks like him. But he not only can see, guess what he stopped doing? He stopped begging. He's just traveling like anybody else. And so they're confused because not only is he able to walk without help, he's changed his behavior. And when our behavior changes, it's fascinating to me at how other people want to act like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, you've changed, you've changed getting up in years, about 54 years old next month, and at some point, the dreaded high school reunion is coming back. I don't know what happens, and whenever I find the date, I know I'm probably going to have about six months to try to get back in shape. I think most of us hit that panic button. What never fails at the high school reunion, and those of you who are young, especially those of you graduating, get ready for this, nobody's going to come up to you at the reunion and say, you know what, do you remember when we took that mission trip? Do you remember how we used to go to area-wide devotionals? Do you remember when we used to go to those teen conferences? Nope. They come up with like the only big sin you ever did. Do you remember when you did such and such? And I'm like, it's been 35, 40 years. I've changed. (laughs) Right. 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 Our change of behavior will cause people to question. So they're questioning, and they're questioning to the point in which the people decide to take him to the Pharisees. We're going to get to the bottom of this miracle. And so it says they brought to the Pharisees the man who'd been blind. And now on the day in which Jesus made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath day. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him, how'd you receive sight? He said, he put mud on my eyes, a wash, now I see. And some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not even keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. They were divided because of another passage that most of us have memorized. We usually call it the greatest commands. Command number one is to love the Lord your God. And the second is like, like it, love your, love your neighbors yourself. Most of us have that memorized. They had this memorized, except there were two schools. There was the school of Shammai, and there was the school of Hillel. They answered this question. Because every time we see this in Scripture, we're thinking, well, everybody has the same answer. Or maybe Jesus is making up these answers. But he wasn't. Every rabbi had an answer to, these quest- to the question of what's the greatest commandments. Number one was always the same. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Number two could change. And it depended if you followed Hillel or if you followed Shammai. If you followed Hillel, it would basically be love your neighbor as yourself. If you followed Shammai, it would say keep the Sabbath. Because Hillel was about love and Shammai was about law. And that's why they're divided. Because the Shammai believers are basically saying... This can't even be right. This man is not of God because he is working on the Sabbath. The other group says, I don't know. I don't know. It seems like he's loving people. Seems like he's loving people on the Sabbath. And so they're divided and have contention with this. They're confused and they're in conflict. They, others ask, uh, finally they turned to the blind man and said, what do you have to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And the man replied, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been born blind and received his sight. So they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they ask? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he can now see? We know he's our son, the parents answered. And we know that he was born blind. But how he came to see? 
How his eyes were open? We don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. So the people have an issue. The Pharisees have an issue. The parents have an issue, which is so opposite of today. Parents today, not all parents, but most parents are, are pretty open about defending their children. In fact, they can say their child did something wrong. But if you say their child did something wrong, holy smokes. I know not this hypothetical parents here. These are parents outside of Hunter Hills. But you say something just discouraged about somebody's kid and they come apart. They'll even come up and say, it's okay for me to say that, but you can't say that. I grew up in a time where there were no video cameras. Anybody who was within range of Paul Evans' behavior had the right to straighten them out. And my mom would often hear, your kid will not behave. And she never disagreed. She's like, that's right. He's not able to. My behavior went into all areas. You know, as I got older, uh, I actually spent a lot of years with my grandparents. Um, and I learned a lot from my grandfather, really missed both of them being here. And yet when I got away from their care, I didn't really pay them much attention. I know this didn't happen. I know all grandchildren here pay 100% uh, attention to their grandparents. My grandmother calls me up one day. I don't, I'm probably about 18 years old. Hey, Paul. Hey, I missed the phone call. The phone was ringing. I tried to get to it. I couldn't get to it in time. I'm, I'm so disappointed. I, I was afraid I missed a call from you. I said, no, Mama B, I didn't call. I know you didn't call your old grandmama every now and then. She was straightening me out. Y'all, grandparents, that y'all can go home and use that this afternoon if your grandkids are not, not playing it right. So she was even getting on to me. This guy's parents, zero help. Well, yeah, that's our kid. And yeah, he was born blind. But he's, he's over 18. He is on his own. Because they were scared. Because they would be thrown out of the synagogue. And it wasn't for a week. And it wasn't for a month. You were going to get thrown out for life. Christ says, I come that you might have life to the full. And their life was wrapped up in the synagogue. And they were going to be cast out. And when you were cast out, you didn't just lose presence in the synagogue. You lost presence in the community. If you had a business in the community, guess who was not getting any more community support? So there was a lot on the line. It was not simply, we're scared of the Pharisees. They were scared of a loss. And so they ask him again. A second time, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. And they ask him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I've already told you, you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you too want to become his disciple? You've got to love this guy because this was not done in this culture, especially not done in front of religious leaders. He's had a miracle take place. He's had life change take place. He's had behavior change take place. He's experiencing life to the full, and he's not going to allow an element to not only discourage him, but he's not even going to get intimidated by it. I think that's a challenging message for us today simply because we've got a lot in our society that shifted over the, just the past few years. You know, prayer has been out of school for a while. Marla and I were watching a show last night. It was like a legal show. And someone was sworn in to give their testimony. And it said, do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? No Bible, no so help me God, gone. Those elements are gone, right? So when we think about our lives, where our society is, where even some of our laws are it's tough at times to stand up and not be intimidated some of you if you were vocal about God at your work you could actually lose your job and get fired and that was the parents fear we could lose our work our society our connections we could lose it all we could get fired from our society but he's bold because it's happened to him personally Everybody else are witnesses and don't know what to make of it. He's experienced it, and it changed him. When we experience life in Christ, it's totally different. 
then we just simply observe it from a distance. So they hurled insults at him. Here, <laughs> religious people, honesty, we can become some of the most rough people when somebody has an argument that we might not like, but we can't really disagree with, with logic, we can get pretty ugly. Even if it's like legal issues that we face, I think most of us are probably in some like Christian groups and social media, and it's always amazing when something comes out about a law changing. Uh, recently, I mean, the abortion issue is a huge issue, but are we gonna come out and hurl insults? Or are we gonna hurl some love? Are we gonna hurl some compassion? Are we going to hurl some understanding? Because I, I've not found one time in my life when I'm hurling insults that things went very well and that people came to my side. Well, you know what, Paul, now that you've insulted me, I, I can see where you're coming from. You're right. I now accept your view. It's, it's never worked. And believe me, I've hurled many an insult through the years. It's never paid off. He says, we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke through Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And the man says, that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. He listens to godly men who do, who do his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. So his parents' fear became his result. But he's not too bothered by it because in the next section, Jesus finds him, locates him, and says, do you believe in the Son of Man? He says, let me see him. If I knew who he was, I would believe. He said, I am he. And he bows down. He worships him. And he makes a statement about blindness. And the Pharisees say, are we too blind? And Jesus basically says, you are blind. Because you think you're in the light. So when it comes to living life to the full, the first overall point of that, but once we see the, the example of the people and the Pharisees and the parents, is that we've got to live in the light of Christ. Our world's dark. It's dangerous. So we've got to live in the light. In chapter 10, he goes on to really hit a lot of aspects about the shepherd and about the sheep knowing his voice. And about anybody who comes in by another way is just a thief. And we finally get to that point in which he says, the thief comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. And we saw all of that in chapter 9. But he says, I've come that you may have life, and life to the full. And when Jesus describes himself as the shepherd, he's basically saying, not only do I want you to live in the light, I want you to live in my care. I want you to live within my comfort. I want you to live within my presence, within my protection. And that's a challenge as well in our day because we do live in dangerous times and times that we need to be protected, not just physically, but emotionally. How challenged our society is. How at the drop of a hat somebody can just go off. I mean, road rage is higher than ever. Uh, if you're on on line at all, you're constantly seeing videos of people who are taking matters into their own hands or seem to have lost their mind. You think about the number of crime, especially in big cities where they're just downtown doing whatever, just crashing shop windows. It's a dangerous time. And so he's saying, live in my light, but also live in my care. One of the ways that we live in his care is this, that we care for each other that we love each other, that we know each other's problems, that we're all part of this flock. So we share, and we care, and we allow Christ's light to flow through us and through each other. So this week, as you look at maybe this in a little more detail, or you look at some of your other favorite passages, don't just think about the content. Think about the context and what it actually means means. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We are so grateful for Jesus Christ who came to say, look, it's a dark world, but I'm the light of the world. And we thank you that he gives us the picture of being the shepherd, that as the shepherd, he's going to guide us. He's going to lead us. He's going to protect us. He's going to heal us. And we pray that we see that happening within our own lives. And we pray as well that we do that as a congregation, as a church. Most of all, I pray, God, that we do live as this blind man who now sees 
who was convicted, who was changed, who was not intimidated by his world. Pray this in Jesus' name. We say together, amen. Your light broke through my night, restored exceeding joy. Your grace fell like the rain and made this desert fill. You had turned my morning into dancing. You had turned my sorrow into joy. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. Your hand lifted me up. I stand on higher ground. Your praise rose in my heart. May this valley sing, you have turned my morning into dancing, you have turned my sorrow into joy, you have turned my morning into dancing, you have turned sorrow into joy. This is how we overcome. This is how we overcome. This is how we overcome. This is how we again to everyone being here. Praise team, thank you so much. Fantastic job. Paul did a great job as always. Bob, appreciate those thoughts during communion. Let's, uh, before we're sent, let's uh, read our closing benediction together. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who belongs to God, that we may declare the praises of him who called us out into his marvelous life. Once we were not a people, but now we are God's people. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. Thanks, everyone.